everyone, I'm Heather. Um, thank you so much to Leanne for having me along tonight. What I'm going to do is, Leanne, I'm just going to share my screen just now. And uh, hopefully you can see all that right now. So uh, my name's Heather and uh, I'm from the University of Glasgow. I'm a senior lecturer from the School of Psychology at the University. And I run um, the hashtag Sleepy Teens project. And we look at adolescent social media use, sleep and well-being in young people. So really what I thought we would do tonight, we would set it up. And Leanne's given me um, giving you the information that you need. We've got kind of two parts. I've set up these slides um, in a couple of parts. The first part is telling you a little bit about, um, about the Sleepy Teens project itself and some of the concerns related to saying evidence and ongoing research. And then I thought we'd have just a kind of wee break and that's where we can pick up the questions that you'll have and that you'll have put in the Q&A function, just as Leanne was saying there. So we can scoop up those questions, get them answered, and then we can move on about implementing sleepy teens in, in, your, in your schools and moving the discussion forward. So I'm really hoping that tonight you find interesting and it gives you some food for thought. Um, but of course, um, you know, we all know what it's like when you're sitting and you're listening to someone. It's a Wednesday evening at seven o'clock. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. So let's keep it um, as interactive and get some questions in the Q&A function. That would be fantastic. So um, just also to say, um, I am at home. I'm sitting up here up the stairs, but with it being a Wednesday evening, my husband's here, my kids are here. So if you hear anything in the background or the music or whatever, or somebody comes in, please forgive me because at these times we're, we're all working from home and juggling a lot so um and of course it's all the same for we know that we're the same for everybody so let's get started so let me give you a wee overview of the sleepy teens project so this is the research team so that's me in the middle slightly shorter here might need to update my picture there and it's two very important people um, with the sleepy teen project we have um professor S stephanie biello who um, is now the, the Dean of Learning and Teaching for the College of Science and Engineering at the University of Glasgow. And she co-supervised a very important person in this project, Dr. Holly Scott. So a lot of the work I'll be talking to you about with the Sleepy Teens work, or some of the work is part of her PhD. Um, she graduated from her PhD uh, last year and is now a colleague of mine at uh, the School of Psychology at the University of Glasgow. So this is the research team. So I run this project. And really where this project came from was, um, so I have two children and I'm really coming at this uh, as a researcher um, with an interest in sleep. My PhD was on kind of sleeping and things that stop us sleeping well. Um, but I also come up at it from a, a parent's point of view. Um, I'm also a mother, a mom, I have a 15 year old and a nine year, uh, nine year old, two daughters. And so what happened was um, I came back to work after having my second daughter and there was a lot of, it was sort of David Cameron and Hug a Hoodie time and there was a lot of um, media headlines going about talking about how, you know, behaviour, bad behaviour in young people and it was all about they were staying up all night, not getting enough sleep and staying up all night gaming and it was all the fault, fault of devices. These are kind of, um, the devices were getting a really hard time. And so I thought, well, this is really interesting. This is something I really need to know about in terms of bringing together my, my research interests. But also, you know, I have children that are growing up. I need to know about this and how we use this. And so it really kind of got to the point that I started to dig and start to have a look at the research. And there really wasn't very much at that time. But some people, for example, Jean Twang, there were other researchers out there that were very much taking this, um, this very negative view of social media use of being online, the use of this term screen time, and how it was really going to um, have this very negative impact on our on our young people and the future generation. Now I've put that little um, that little um, image in the middle there, so. Um, we call that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And it's really just about basic human needs. So at the bottom, you have your physiological needs that you need to survive. And then right up at the top, you have your self-actualization, which is, you know, understanding you as a person and how you fit in with the people around you. But obviously in a kind of tongue in cheek, silly way at the bottom of put, you know, battery in your devices and Wi-Fi, because we all know and have experience and have witnessed our young people, but personal experience as well of, you know, I'm running out of battery or I don't have a signal. 
and how it's interesting how that kind of response and that that um need to be online or that drive to be online has led to some people using quite quite negative pathologizing language such as you know social media use addiction so people being addicted to their phone or addicted to Facebook or addicted to Instagram and these words are being used so what we're going to do tonight is just talk a little bit about the language that's used around this as well so these were some of the some of the headlines we were seeing teenagers are losing sleep thanks to social media um, and so I really wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper to try and understand not just about sleep and not just about social media use, but how these two things interact. And actually, through the process of, of our work, we have um, presented um, and given evidence at the Science and Technology um, Select Committees in, in Westminster, because we realise that as a government, as a UK government, and but also as a, a, a Scottish government, these are questions that are being asked by policy makers and the impact of social media and screen use on young people's health. And this is a discussion that's still ongoing. And those discussions will have impact on how, um, you know, how these aspects are talked about with our young people in schools um, and policies around them. So what we wanted to do at the Sleepy Teens Project was really to enhance the available evidence to support and make sure we're having informed decision making. And those decisions weren't just being made by um, journalists or people, you know, reading the headlines or, you know, being really kind of insecure and not really understanding. And let's be frank, you know, quite unsettled by what was being spoken about around this topic. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure there was good, solid um, evidence there to inform our decision making. And we wanted to examine social media separate from other technology use and try and tackle this phrase screen time. So what's quite interesting is when, when I think about the amount of time I spend on a screen during a day, it is a lot. It will be even higher today because I'm doing this. But if I wasn't doing this, I would be doing other things and I would be off screens. But screen time doesn't really tell you very much about what you're doing on that screen. We also wanted to move forward from that and actually incorporate that adolescent voice. One of the things we're very good at is, you know, as, as, as parents, as carers, as teachers, we want to make sure we are doing the very best for our young people and for our children. And sometimes maybe we forget to ask about their experience. And we have these preconceptions and stereotypes. And as a mother, a lot of them are absolutely true about adolescents, about teenagers. But we need to want, we really wanted to rather than put our kind of feelings and beliefs and cognitions about this process onto them, we wanted to add their voice to really understand what they were thinking about it. So that were kind of, they were the kind of general aims of the project. So this is a paper we published um, in 2019, my goodness, a couple of years ago now, I was going to say last year. And this was a, a study that looked at age 14, um, 14 year olds. Um, and what we wanted to do with this study was to really kind of understand, is this a problem? And when we're talking about preconceptions or stereotypes we have of young people, is this a problem for everybody in the same way? Kind of like the same thing when we say, you know, oh, all teenagers are lazy, all they want to do is lie in their bed all day. And actually, as somebody who works in sleep, um, I can understand that. I can absolutely understand that. Um, but what we also understand is with adolescent sleep, it shifts. Now, we don't really know why that is. It seems to be something to do with this developmental phase that teenagers tend to want to go to sleep later at night or earlier in the morning and sleep longer into the day. So that's quite a typical adolescent, um, adolescent um, aspect of being a teenager. But what we wanted to understand here was, is everybody using social media for the same amount of time and is it an issue for everybody? So as I say, eight, 14 year olds. And so what we found here in this plot was that actually, I'm gonna put my wee pointer on here. So what we actually found here was about a third of the 14 year olds in this study were actually using or reporting using social media for less than an hour a day. The average use was between one and three hours per day. And that was again about a third. High users, which was three to five hours a day, was about 14%. And about a fifth of them were using them for five for using social media for five or more hours a day. So they were very high use. 
So this was interesting for us in, t- in terms of informing, actually, not all adolescents, not all teenagers are using social media for the same amount of time. So that kind of typical having um, um, teenagers walking about on their phones all the time, not lifting up from it, being engaged with it all the time, actually in terms of social media use, there was diversity in about an amount of time that people were using. So that makes us think about this use of screen time and how helpful that actually is. But saying that, we do know that the higher social media users, so these kind of groups here where you're using it for sort of three to five hours or particularly five hours or more a day, and it is helpful to think about how much that would be around school and other things that are happening. We know those particular teenagers who had later bedtimes They had more difficulty falling asleep after nighttime awakenings. But what we did was we made sure that this was actually attributed to the amount of time they were spending on social media rather than being related to well-being or other demographics, health, the level of physical activity. So we wanted to make sure this was actually due to social media use. So what, how did this take us forward then? What it did was um, we, we actually gave us an opportunity to understand about adolescent use in the UK over the past, you know, over the past decade or so to really understand. So that UK profile is a baseline. So rather than just having that kind of sweeping generalization, we want we actually now understand about this profile of use. It allowed us to give meaningful comparisons to average users. So what that means is when we took that one to two, three, um, this category here, one to three hours as the average user, we know that these, these two very high and very high, the, the, the people that fell into that and um, those categories had, you know, took longer to fall asleep, had poorer sleep. And we wanted to control for this really large range of what we call covariates, other factors that could be explaining this. But what it didn't do, it didn't take us beyond this time spent using social media. And it didn't really give us in or this notion of screen time. And it didn't really add this voice, this adolescent perspective of why are you using it? What's your experience of using it? Because we have to remember one of our aims is really to understand the social aspect of social media use rather than focusing on the media. So what we did was we went and spoke to to young people. So um, this was uh, published in in 2019. So again, I'm just focusing on 14-year-olds. This was now 11 to 18-year-olds. We've got a wider spread. It's sort of kind of more typical high school age adolescents. And so what we did was we... um, we did a qualitative study, so we ran focus groups. So um, our researchers both spoke to small groups of um, males and females. And really the, what the young people were telling us in this study was it was all about something that really we are all very familiar with. And particularly we can remember probably from our teenage years. So that fear of missing out, not wanting to be that person that had an offline co- a cost. So when we talk about offline costs here, what we're meaning is, you know, nobody wants to be that person that walks into the playground or walks into school the next day and there's been a bit of gossip or a bit of chat that's been online and we're sitting there going, don't know what you're talking about. And that feeling of, you know, the online conversations and social interactions, if you're not part of that, there is an offline cost. So the kind of constant threat of it now being available 24-7 and not being having that time. I I tell this story a lot, but, you know, in the olden days when I was a teenager long, long ago, it used to be that I would walk to school with my friends. I'd be at school with my friends all the time. I'd walk home from school. I might see them after school for a wee while or I'd speak to them on the phone. But really, there was a kind of natural point in the day that my friends weren't in my house. But this has now changed, obviously, because with devices, our friends and family can be with us 24-7, which has a lot of of positives to it. But some people can find that, you know, a little bit of pressure and that of of having that pressure to interact and not being able to disengage if you are, you know, in part of a conversation or part of, uh, you know, an interaction. It's quite difficult to say, I'm sorry, but I don't want to speak to you anymore. I don't want to be part of this anymore. And Daniel tells us a little bit about this here with this quote. 
you're always wondering, what's everyone else doing? Are they speaking to each other? Am I missing out? Should I be on this? Should I be up? And then, yeah, it affects my sleep. Now, what's really interesting about what Daniel's telling us there is what he's saying is not necessarily about the device. What he's telling us is very clearly it's about the social interaction. It's about the social interaction with these friends. Who's speaking to who? What are they talking about? Should I be part of that conversation? And what that's leading to is this pre-sleep cognitive arousal where he's not able to switch off and go, right, I'm just, that's it. Everybody's away doing their own thing now. I can relax and just chill out a little bit. The other thing that came out from, um, from our young people were um, the norms and expectations around it. So just as part of being a normal teenager, everybody's doing it. It's not anything that is, is unusual or, or rare to see nowadays. So it's just part of normal teenager teenage life. And that's interesting when we think about teenagers and we think about our young people, that social interaction and, and teenagers' friends are the most important or some of the most important people in their lives. And as part of adolescence, we actually see, and this is you know, a physiological brain, physio uh, a neurological change as well, where we actually see the parts of the brain that are associated with reward and emotion, they're developing. And it's really all about their peers and this move from most important people in your life being the people that are caring for you, the people that are at home, to being your friends. And, and that's part of that growing independence. So it's part of social interaction and being online social interaction is very important to teenagers and it's just part of life. Violating etiquette, this was something that really quite um, surprised me as well as obligation. And it was, again, comes back to the importance of this social interaction. But actually it was about violating etiquette for if you, you know, Harry's saying there, you can't just leave them because of seeing that you've read it. So you'd sort of get stuck talking to a person. Now, what Harry's saying there is not really, you know, a great, you know, a great um, motivator for staying in a conversation. Like, oh, I'm kind of stuck with you now. But because somebody sees that you've read a message, so they hold this etiquette. And also when we, we they talked about obligation, it was very much like, if I'm not online and available for someone, I'm not a good friend. And I was I'm feeling very guilty if somebody had reached out and they weren't there to actually pick up the message. So it really shows the importance of this social interaction and how powerful these social drivers are that and they can create difficulty disengaging. But as we see from the previous study, not for all, for some of our, our young people. It's not just about social media behavior. It's not about the device. There are very emotional and cognitive components to this. So it's about emotional engagement to this. I feel obligated. I want to speak to you. I want to be available for you, but I know that you're available 24 seven. And it really did give us this rich, in-depth insight from adolescent um, experience. And I really think this was one of the most important studies that we've done as part of the project of being able to have the young people tell us about social experience and what media lends to that social experience um, in the 2020s. So what do we do? What do we do with this? One of the most important things we do with this kind of information is um, it really gives us an evidence base where we can tackle um, other areas of research that we might perhaps have some concern about. So I'm not obviously particularly picking on this website, but it's interesting when we hear about the blue light um, discussion. Um, and from what we know about the research, yes, blue light does act on a, a chemical in your brain called melatonin and it suppresses melatonin. Melatonin is like your sleep hormone and it gradually increases over the day and that's you know what makes you feel, feel sleepy. Blue light suppresses that and that's why it, you know, it can keep you awake. But actually what we understand from that is the blue light from screens, you would need to be very close to it for a very long time, you know, right up there. You maybe get a kind of 10 minute delay in your sleep onset. It's not going to keep you up all night. But actually what we see here is we see a marketplace developing where people are like, oh, this is something that I need to do, that I need to be able to buy this 
to prevent this happening from, from my child. Now, of course, some people may find these things very useful and very helpful. And that, of course, that's absolutely, absolutely fine. But what we want to do at Sleepy Teens is make sure people can have make these informed decisions and understand well, one of the things that's keeping people on devices at nighttime is actually their friends. It's that social interaction, which is very typical of teenagers. They want to socially interact with their peers. You know, and you know, as we all do, we want to make sure we have that time in the day where we can interact with friends. So it's about making those informed decisions and understanding the, the biological and cognitive processes that the value of friendship and, and social interaction and connection. And I think that's particularly important in the current circumstances that we're living in, that actually when our children have had to stay home, haven't been able to meet up, haven't been at school, the role of devices and social media of enabling them to main, maintain social connections. So what we wanted to, to address here was how do we measure this? How can we actually help people make these informed decisions by enabling them to take a measure of what we're talking about here, these emotional connections and the, the processes that are going through and the value of social so the current issues that we really have here was this, again, this focus on generic screen time, which doesn't tell us anything about the social net nature or, or whatever is happening on the screen. The tendency to go from use to addiction, to pathologizing media use, to making, you know, measuring, it, just taking the, the, the stance, this is bad, no matter what, we're just going to tell you how bad it is. It's very, very difficult to maintain pace with a rapidly evolving media landscape. So we have made the conscious choice not to focus on that. Well, we have we have some studies, but it's not the major focus of our, our work of, you know, how are you using Snapchat? How are you using TikTok? How are you using Facebook? Because we know that, for example, over the past few years, you know, young people aren't engaging with Facebook quite so much because that's where your parents are. That's where your grandparents are. So it's not that young people's you know, social um, landscape anymore, although it still is um, the, if not the, one of the most popular social media sites. We have a lot of calls for longitudinal studies. What that means is actually following people over a long period of time, but that isn't necessarily always helpful because we want to understand what's happening now and it will change. So we needed to get some kind of measure to capture these unique sleep relevant aspects of social media use. So we came up with the inode, which is a very simple 10 question measure where it has, and it's been taken from the, um, the study, the focus group study that we did, where we talked to the young people and they, they talked about it, the importance of staying connected and following etiquette and, and fear of missing out. So I would feel left out for my friends if I could not use social media at night. I feel like a bad friend if I don't answer messages quickly. So these are the kind of questions we ask. And it's a very simple measure, 10 questions where people can select whether they feel that's true of them or not. And what we can then do is we can actually um, provide an evidence base for, for example, that class or that school or that year group or whatever where we can actually understand this is the profile, these are um, this, the kind of how, how distressed about being online, offline that these people are. So it's a, it's a really easy way for us to move away from, from um, terms that aren't particularly um, relevant to this, but also to focus on the social aspect. So, so what we found with this when we, when we rolled this out, this measure out, um, adolescents that were more concerned about staying connected and following etiquette use social media for longer in bed and after they felt they should be asleep. They spent longer in bed before trying to sleep, so the shut-eye latency, so just lying in bed before you actually close your eyes to go to sleep. They fell asleep later, they woke up at the same time, and they are, of course, if you um, are falling asleep later, but you still have to get up at a certain time for school, for example, you're going to have a shorter sleep duration, you're going to sleep for less time. And they reported sleep quality, uh, excuse me, reported poorer sleep quality. But there was considerable variation in the level of concern experience. This was not the same. Not all teenagers, not all adolescents are exactly the same and aren't showing the same level of concern with this or, or, or offline distress. So it really did bring us forward that it captures, allow or helps us capture issues that adolescents themselves identify as affecting their sleep. 
But we still have to explore how can this inform approaches so we can support our young people because we know and understand the importance of healthy adolescent sleep. So how can we support um, our teenagers to get that? So Holly and I are um, hopefully, you know, productively very busy and we use our research base to talk about ways that we can help and have discussions with people and exactly what, you know, hopefully the discussion we're going to have tonight about how um, we can have, we now have a changing evidence base and evolving evidence base that's saying just taking people's phones away from them or limiting screen use doesn't help us tackle sleep problems, but understanding the social aspect of it can help us have a, a, a different conversation that might help us support um, young people and families and schools for everyone to get a better night's sleep, which can ov obviously have positive impact in terms of academic performance, of well-being, um, yeah, a, a number of um, a number of positive impacts. And I think the, the, the conversation is changing um, slightly, which I very much welcome. This is a very typical picture of teenage girls on their on their phones um, down in London. Andrew Shabelsky and Amy Orban are doing really interesting work, much more looking at, at media and the impact of media. And, and really, they did publish this um, piece in The Guardian a couple of years ago, um, where they really are tackling along with themselves this, um, you know, where is the evidence that this term screen time, that the time that people or young people are spending on screen, how does that actually, you know, where's the evidence that this is as bad as some people are telling us? This does not mean that we are not, you know, we are, you know, um, dismissing this as an issue. And I know for parents and teachers every day we tackle um, a lot of discussion and, and issues around social media use and I am completely completely accepting that and I'm sure we'll we'll talk a little bit about that um about that um I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in in the coming time we have together um but really the point that I'm trying to make here is to have an informed discussion about it it can really help us understand what young people are telling us and what the evidence is around and really understand the different aspects of what being online and social media use really is. So the partners we have worked with, um, we just wanted to kind of share that we have worked with a lot of partners, some charity partners, um, Scottish government, Westminster government. And so they have really kind of helped us in um, and, and working in partnership is incredibly important to the work that we do. So yes, why don't I stop sharing my screen? And maybe what we can do is, is answer some of the questions that have been coming through. Is that OK, Leanne? Yeah, sure, Heather. Yeah, we have some questions already. Um, so I'll just go through them then as they're shown on my screen here. So Julie is asking, when you're talking about social media, are you including gaming in that? I suppose that's um, became quite a big thing as well nowadays. Yeah, so this is that's a really, really good question. Sorry, who was asking that? Julie. Right, thanks, Julie. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. And one of the, when I was talking about how it's such a, a sort of fast changing multimedia landscape, even to use the word social media now is a term. And what we use is any any media that will facilitate social engagement and social interaction. So that's really what we mean by that, rather than you know the typical what we might think is social media in terms of you know Facebooks, Instagram, Snapchat. So we really think about anything that facilitates social interaction. And now with gaming, a lot of young people, my understanding is that they actually will, gaming is now a social interaction as well. So very possibly the social interaction is part of the drive to maintain engagement with uh, with, with games. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll read out, Debbie's got a couple of questions because this kind of links into the social media side of it. Um, what do you consider as social media in your study? So I suppose you've kind of just clarified that because yeah. she's asking, do you mean like Insta, Snapchat, or, or do you include YouTube watching? It's anything, as I say, it's anything really that is social interaction. We There are studies that are trying to dig very much deeper into what people are using and what we can we feel that that's actually separate it's about the social interaction but what we, when we speak to our young people what we find is there's not just one thing going on at the same time so it might be that people are watching youtube something on youtube 
but also talking about it or even just having a couple of things going on. But really what we're focusing on is the social interaction over whatever platform that will be. Yeah, so so I guess maybe YouTube wouldn't so much come under that because you don't you don't really socially interact. I, I suppose it's like us watching TV, like yeah. as old as old folk, as old folk <laughs> we, watching we, actual we just TV, watch regular TV. Um, but I know that particularly even my teenager and younger kids, YouTube is like yeah. their TV. Um, yes. so I can understand why Debbie was probably asking that. Absolutely, no, I think it's a really valuable question, but also is, I think that's a really good point you've just made there, Leanne, where you know. <clears throat> think about yourselves and I'm I'm like now thinking like this is not just me that does that but if you're watching tv at night but you're on your phone and you're chatting at the same time so the days of what it used to be like in my house that my mom and dad would sit down at night and they'd be watching television and that was the activity that was happening but nowadays we're doing multiple things and you might even have the tv on have half you know kind of watching something but doing a wee bit of work or chatting to a friend so it is about kind of multi-device now and multiple platforms all at the same time yeah and then debbie's follow-up question is did uh, did you find any differences between boys and girls and how they're affected This is, again, these questions are absolutely spot on. I'm going to talk about a wee bit about that later on. This is a big question that comes up a lot. Um, We haven't haven't found any differences between boys and girls, particularly at this point, but we are actually running a study at the moment, and that is exactly what we're looking at, to try and understand over adolescence, are there differences between uh, boys and girls? Um, but also are we seeing differences between younger adolescents and older adolescents and we have done a small scale study where we do tend to see differences in age but we haven't seen any differences in um in gender yet yeah because that would be quite interesting i think um to because probably the younger kids i'm thinking under maybe even 10 whilst they might like to go on to snapchat or things like that like some of the stuff you'd said about feeling that pressure to respond to messages, I'm just assuming because I don't have a child under that age, but I just get the impression that probably younger kids maybe wouldn't feel that pressure to be messaging their their pals as much, whereas teens um, always feel that pressure to kind of be in the know and not miss out on anything. Um, I, I don't know if maybe you kind of feel that would be the same thing yeah. as well. I think one of the things I would say is what I found incredibly interesting <clears throat> about, um, I think there was a lot of things that are incredibly interesting about the first lockdown. So at this time last year, where really everything was, so I now know this lockdown, the younger kids have actually been able to see each other outdoors a little bit more. So they have been able to maintain a certain level of social connection, even out with school. Um, but so my, my nine-year-old, So she turned nine last July. And what I was really worried about was actually my older teenager, you know, 14, and you go into and you can't see your friends. You know, how absolutely seeing our friends was, you know, our whole life. But actually, what was really interesting, and this is obviously just me talking about my own own house and, and being quite anecdotal, but I think it does highlight the differences in quite a short age range, okay, five years, but still quite short. That my young, it was actually my, uh, my younger daughter that we ended up having to having more concerns about, and I don't mean that in, in any other way than realizing that really she didn't have the social media et- um, knowledge or etiquette mm-hmm. to understand. So we would do things like set up little Zoom lunches with her and her friends, so they could have a wee bit of time together, and they didn't know how to use it. <laughs> they just didn't know they were like what, what do you want me to do because they were used to being outside playing in the yeah. garden playing in the playground yeah. they didn't know what to do so I think there is that difference of learning about it as a young adolescent as you move into um, you know pre-adolescence as you move into adolescence realizing this is a thing that you know teenagers do learning what it facilitates and as you come out of adolescence actually realizing that, you know, actually I can set my boundaries and we've done some work with kind of first year university students where they are very aware of the pros and cons of it and are actually developing older adolescents. We did a study recently where they were they were actually very much saying, no, I, take, I am very aware of what 
is happening here, what I'm involved with, and I now know how I can take control. So if people aren't being particularly nice to me on a particular you know, platform or in a conversation, then I just remove myself from it. I don't want to be part of it. So it's, it's again, it highlights the kind of complexities of the social interaction part of it rather than just the media part of it. Yeah. But we are running a study that is looking specifically at these age differences as well as these gender differences, which we haven't picked up on before. And I've got some details of that at the end if you're interested. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And, and obviously, I mean, we, we, we would welcome you back at any point if you have more information because it's Absolutely. really interesting. Absolutely. Um, Kareen's just adding that she's found, she found the same, um, like you're saying, Heather, with her younger one uh, at 12, that they seem to find it more difficult than the 16-year-old as yes. well. So, yeah, I think what you're saying is kind of ringing true with some parents. So Gary's asked, has depression numbers risen in teenagers due to social media use and isolation? Okay, so this is really interesting. That was Gary, I think you said, Leanne? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, that's really interesting, Gary. So... One of the so one of the the, um, the the things that we looked at, I'll use it, I'll use the study that we've done particularly on this, and then I'll talk about more kind of recent years. So we published a study, but it was, it was back in 2016. Now that I'm just actually realising that's five years old now, which is kind of quite scary. But we did a study, and we very much came at it and saying, right, okay, here's all these headlines, here's all these discussions that we are aware of that are saying social media use is related to, you know, poorer well-being in our young people. But I wanted to sort of understand that in the context of sleep and say, okay, let's do a study to to find the evidence for this. So one of the things I hopefully you'll take away from this talk of the importance of evidence and going, yes, this has been shown, this has been and shown quite clearly. And so what we did was we looked at, we, we gave a, a survey out to about 500 11 to 18 year old Scottish schools, um, Scottish school kids. And what we found was that actually nighttime social media use particularly was related to an increase in anxiety, an increase in depression and a lower self-esteem. But what was really interesting about that more than that was actually the effects of that. So what you have to do, find is understand that you can have a significant effect. The effect can be there, but it can be very, very, very small. And so I had this really interesting kind of baptism of fine into this a- area of research because the press picks up on this study and it was all over the, all these papers. And I'm going, ah, like study finds. We've eventually found the study that will tell us that, yes, social media uses... It's, that will increase your anxiety. It will make you know, make you depressed, and will decrease your self esteem. And what I had to go back and do is say, but it's tiny, and because it's such a small relationship, a such you know, quite a weak relationship, there's so much else that can actually explain that. So there are things like, for example, what we call social comparison, which is when you sit on you know Instagram and you go, look at her, look at the holiday they're having, and you know, look at. You can and you compare yourself. That's about again about that's the social interaction. And so some people will have that, and that will be they will get caught up in that. But there's so many other factors that social media isn't necessarily causing that. There is a very, very kind of small, small, small relationship between social media use, particularly nighttime social media use and and those impacts so there's it's not just about social it's about so much more yeah I think um just because of a lot that's happened over the last couple of years in the media particularly I suppose some of the reality tv stars over the last couple of years and the connection that the press have made to social media and and their mental health um, I can understand why parents would have that concern. Completely, um, completely. Because, because yes, yeah, certainly I do. And and like you're saying um, about the university students learning that if this is not a good environment for me to step away from it, that's what I'm kind of constantly trying to teach my yeah. teenager at the moment. Um, yeah. And it all stems back to me worrying that it's affecting their mental health. So I'm like, well, like if somebody's being horrible to you, you just block them or you step away from it. It's it's uh-huh. kind of your your profile, your page. 
So you control it the way, yeah, you control it how you can. And Mm -hmm. if you can't, then you try and step away from it in some way or other. No, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think these are the discussions that we would be having with our kids anyway, right? You know, if somebody's saying something nasty to you in the playground or when you meet them outside, you're like, well, just don't bother, walk away from them. You you have the power to interact with those people that you want to interact, that make you feel good about yourself, that you enjoy having. It's exactly the same thing here. And I think that's a really important part of us changing this discussion and saying, any inter it's social interaction and any social interaction we have we have some we come away going do you know that was great I love that we're having a really great discussion here and I'm really hoping I'm not the only one that's really enjoying it but it's a social interaction we're talking about things that that are of common interest to us but you know if you came on and were like this is rubbish I don't like I would be like, oh, that, you know, social interactions are different and that's part of dealing with other people. So I think that's a really valuable conversation that we can have with our young people. Yeah. So I'll ask you this uh, question from Rose and then we can move on. But obviously, if anybody's got any further questions, like keep them coming. Um, we will go through the questions again once Heather gets through our next bit. Um, so Rose is asking, um, will there be any specific research into gaming, et cetera, as the like the game and function as a context for social interaction so I suppose that's kind of taken uh, the question a wee bit a step further than the previous one yeah um, because obviously we know there is a lot of young people and adults yep. that use gaming as their kind of social life yep so yep. I'm guessing that's probably what you mean Rose um rather than just gaming in general yeah, and I think, I think Rose, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the things that we can do in terms of how we frame questions moving <laughs> forward, so if we are saying to people, what we want you to do, I think about any media that you classify as social. So that might be, you know, online gaming with your friends, sending WhatsApp messages, you know, Instagram, whatever is enabling you to interact with other people, be it in real time having a conversation or or you know posting on something so it's really about us defining that and I think what I'm hearing quite strongly from Rose and other people is to understand the role of this kind of multimedia platforms and different ways of interacting whilst also doing other things so play is one way online play is one way that people are interacting yeah yeah definitely so we can move on now, Heather, if you okay, want. Okay. And then obviously um, just let me know when you're ready if there's any more questions that come through. Okay, I'm quite, that's about quarter to eight. So I think I've, I've got just another kind of 10 slides or so and then um, I hope everybody's at the tea and not rushing off. So I will be as quick as possible, but I'm looking forward to answering any more questions that you have. So thank you for all those questions so far. So what I'm going to do now is actually talk a wee bit more about how we've been working in partnership with schools so far. So what what we wanted to do was when we first set out to do this, we were saying we need to have an intervention. Now, the word intervention, I'm not necessarily always comfortable with because it has that it has that connotation of you need to stop something. You know, you need to stop it right away. We need to intervene here. So what we wanted to do was actually have a discussion with who we, what we call all the stakeholders that were around the table at that particular time. So we had opportunities to work with um, guidance teachers. I think they're now called pastoral support teachers. Um, in my day, it was guidance teachers. Um, we had recent school leavers um, in a focus group. And we also spoke to teachers and people involved in educational policy as part of the Perth and Kinross Health and Wellbeing Learning Festival. And that really gave us um, a a really interesting opportunity to kind of say, right, okay, what are the conversations that are happening? We now have the adolescent voice, but who else is involved in in this conversation that we want to have about changing, looking at the evidence base and changing the conversation to one that's perhaps more helpful for everybody around the table? So the things that came up were kind of bridging the generational gap, self-relevant content, balancing teacher-led and pupil-led activities and the need to engage parents. So I'm going to talk a wee bit more about them just now. So working with partner schools, we have a wee video here, and this is the wee introduction video that we have. We also have this up on our website. 
Um, and really, we, we recruit research partner schools. You contact us. We um, have the whole pack of, you know, uh, parental consent forms, information sheets, everything. We have this wee introductory video as well. And, and then we give you the link to the online pupil survey where people just answer questions online. And what we can then do is take your answers to those particular questions run some analysis and you get a tailored school profile. Now, we've done this for whole schools. We've done this for particular classes. We've done this for year groups. So whatever, we just need to have more than a handful of, of students. And that's just for ethical consideration. So people could be identified by certain answers. So we, um, we and it really what that then enables you to do is it, you have a tailored school profile. So in, instead of talking about something like, you know, children tell us that, you know, who are these children, where do they come from, saying what your year group, what your school are telling us is that you sleep for this number of hours per night, you find this about you, you know, is important for you in terms of your social media use. So it really is about one way that we can use our research to really have that evidence base for people to make, have, have conversations. So there's four steps. You sign school approval, you distribute the parent information, pupils do the 15-minute online survey, and then within um, only a few days you have received uh, tailored evidence. And it's a frame that works flexibil flexibly for schools. So some people have done this as part of their kind of pastoral care, health and wellbeing curriculum um, as part of curriculum of excellence. Some people have just done it for a smaller group. We've had whole schools approaches. So it really is, it can work for you when you want to work it. And if, it, if you want to do it in class time or you want to give it to people to do at home, then that's completely, that's completely fine. But we really have all the, all the information for you. So what came out of this, the school profiles that came out for this were really, really interesting for us. So what we find, oh, I wonder what's happened to this slide. So I'm really sorry, but this slide is not working. Um, so this is the slide that we want to get to. So we, we have run this, we have now have data from over 3000 Scottish um, school children, school pupils. And what we found um, was that on average, they sleep about seven and a half hours on school, um, average seven and a half hours of sleep on school night, sorry. Obviously, uh, Getting, a, getting myself getting a bit tired and I'm running out of words now. So an average to sleep for about seven and a half hours on school nights. Now, the recommended amount of sleep for school children would be between sort of seven and nine. So we're at the kind of lower end there. So we found that two thirds did not get enough sleep on school nights. For social media use, they used on average three hours per day. So what we see there when we looked at that kind of bigger sample of 14 year olds, the average was one to three hours. So you know, they are using it on average for three hours a day. Over half of them, so 58%, use social media in bed every night and on average 30 minutes after pupils feel that they should be asleep. And I think that's a really interesting point to take away from this as well because it's showing that they actually realise that they are tired, that they should be asleep, but they're still engaging on that. So it's that difficulty gets disengaging and that feeling of obligation that they want to be online for their friends. Four and five used Instagram and Snapchat. So this was something that we did to try and kind of understand a little bit about the apps. I know that hasn't been our focus, but we did ask that question here. So most of them are using uh, Instagram and Snapchat, while a few of them are using um, Facebook. And it really was about, I feel like my friends expect me to answer messages quickly. And I feel if I miss out on a group chat, it would bother me. So it does show that it's about this obligation and expectation. These were the big things that they want to be engaged and they don't want to miss out on anything. So evidence-based le um, lessons was really something that was brought home when we spoke to um, Westminster government about this. Um, they wanted to speak to us, part of the one to speak to many, many people um, from, uh, from all different areas of research here. Um, and they really said, to quote, there is a pressing need for the education system to catch up and ensure that young people are equipped it's going to move myself here so I can see the text. There is a pressing need for the education, education system to catch up and ensure that young people are equipped with the skills, skills that they need to navigate social media. We recommend that the pastoral, um, the PSHE, 
uh, curriculum delivers an age appropriate uh, understanding of and resilience towards the harms and benefits of the digital world. So really, it, the report was very, very helpful that came from this select committee because they, they were then changing from this is all really bad to actually what we need to have is our conversations with our young people about both the harms and benefits of that online social world. But really, we need to have the education system is playing a role in this. And it really came across about the, the sort of research partnership with schools that is very, very important. And with, you know, pastoral care is really um, an ideal part of the curriculum to be looking at that. So when we did the stakeholder consultations, this was talking about the, the te talking to the teachers, talking to the pupils, um, and, and, and not really kind of understanding um, what the challenges were. We, we went to the school leavers and the teachers and said, right, what do young people want? What are the constraints of, of delivering this in research partner schools and in the education system? And what support do schools and teachers need? You know, what, 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 what can we do to help here? So rather than moving it from an intervention, we wanted to have more of a consultation. And these came through, as I, measured, uh, as I mentioned before, about the, the shared priority. So this was about pupils and teachers being asked these questions. One of the big things, and I suppose this is not really surprising, but one of the really strong things that came through was bridging the generational gap. So it was really te teachers saying to us about, you know, I, I use, so we talked about this actually just in the conversation that we've just had a, a little bit about, you know, over age, over uh, different age groups, use social media in different ways. So it's about keeping up to date and teachers really felt that they, they needed to be able to speak the same language. Uh, and we know what it's like to have a conversation with, with a young person and you're thinking, I'm just not, we're just not on the same page about this at all. So how do we bridge that generational gap to enable people to feel that they are on the same page and feel comfortable having that conversation rather than I'm delivering information here that I don't really know what it's about. I don't understand why they would use this this particular way. But also for the young people to go, they don't know what they're talking about. This is completely out of date. This is like, you know, so 10 years ago, they're not, they're talking about Facebook, they're not talking about Instagram, Snapchat and TikTok or, you know, online social gaming. So that was really important. The pupils wanted to see self-relevant content. So they wanted to see experiences from the school you're actually in. So we got incredibly good feedback from the pupils about this is not about... Um, you know, the kind of stereotypical teenager that somebody is deciding that I look like. It's about here is the data from your class. Here are your, this is what you've told us about your experiences. And they found that was a really um, powerful motivator for them to engage in these conversations. The balance of pupil and teacher led, I know that I can remember from school um, in the olden days, and I'm sure other people can remember from, it was very much about the teacher standing. So when we're talking about health behaviour, so for example, you know, alcohol use or, you know, safe sex or, or whatever, you know, smoking, it was very much about the teacher standing at the front of the class saying, you should not do this, you should not do that, you know, that's bad, that's bad. But actually the conversation, we see that from, from other areas of um health behaviours and health research that about getting that balance right is incredibly important. So pupil-led approach with buy-in and support from teachers and parents. So it's about the peers, everybody in the class sitting around talking about that going, oh yeah, that's kind of like, okay, so the data that you're presenting here is showing, yeah, that's how I perceive this. This is how I experience this. And the teachers and parents being able to support those conversations. And if we can actually enable those conversations to go around and somebody says you know a pupil says yeah you know I do feel kind of obligated to stay on and I don't necessarily feel that I contribute very much or enjoy those conversations late at night and somebody else says yeah I'm the same so maybe we could agree that actually it's fine that I put my do not disturb on and I'm not going to answer my phone after say 10 o'clock at night so it's about getting that balance of pupil and teacher led right the need to engage parents, this came across really importantly from um, really strongly from teachers as well. So about the, everybody around the, the, the table and the engaged need to engage parents and have parents and teachers and the young people and anybody else who is part of the conversation all talking and all being on the same page. That doesn't necessarily always mean agreeing. 
but certainly having that um, consistent message that is being um, developed at school and that moving home and a, a, you know a helpful message at home moving into school that can really help um, move things forwards in a very positive direction. So it was about these shared priorities and they came through um, they came through from the, the conversations we were having. So what we did was we wanted to pilot some materials to really kind of take that to the next level. So we piloted four weekly 50 minute sessions that were laid by a pastoral care teacher, a guidance teacher. And that was about the survey, the school profile, some tailored slides and activities about sleep and social media use and some teacher guidance notes. Um, discussing data from the own school of the perceptions versus the evidence um, became across as really important. Creating top tips for healthier sleep, so to understand of, of strategies that people could use to improve their sleep, and discussing and challenging common worries about disconnecting and having those things on the table to discuss freely came across as, as these were really, really important. And we also facilitated these people led discussions and take home activities that to help engage the family, and they were very, very positively received as well. So the pupil feedback was on the tailored survey results. I like knowing the statistics and knowing that I'm not the only one, which was really important. With about the discussions, I got everyone thinking about themselves and, um, and talking about their own experiences. I got to see what was normal for other classmates by discussing with them. And um, that was very positive. And the practical ideas uh, for social media and sleep habits, tips on how you can balance your social media and, and sleep were very helpful. So they were the positives that really came back on the pupil feedback. The pupil experiences, so half of them, one in two, were more aware of how social media habits affect their sleep. Um, one in four changed their bedtime social media habits to improve their sleep. So that's a, you know, a quarter of them. So not a bad statistic for just a kind of a few weeks. And another quarter, one in four more, were able to dis discuss the topic with friends, family and teachers. And I think that's a really important part of it, of feeling empowered to have those conversations rather than I'm not going to speak to my parents and teachers about it because they don't know what I'm going through. They don't know what this experience is. They don't really understand. They're not on the same page. So I'm hoping what this is showing is and what we're taking from this is really about empowering people to have conversations. So moving forward, the positive and negative aspects of social media, we are moving beyond using screen time, which doesn't allow us to understand about the social interaction of social media. We're hopefully shaping a more balanced narrative and discussions around social media's benefits. There are positives to it. Social connection is a big one, as well as with any social interaction, there are pitfalls and there can be, can be negatives. We're taking a holistic approach to exploring social media's role in adolescent development about understanding that social interaction and how that's part of their development and actually moving, developing themselves as individuals and independent. But how can we do this together? Well, it's really important we do this together and have and understand the importance and the power that it gives us all to actually connect with each other so we need to build this solid and reliable evidence base for the next generation to take forward as we need to connect with each other now more than ever. And the past year has definitely shown us that. So I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Heather. Um, so we'll just go on to, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, and then if anyone else wants to fire in, feel free. Um, so Mary, Mary or Barry, don't know, I'll, I'll take a guess. Mary's asking, do you think teens and adolescents self-report accurately? Which I think, I, I was thinking that, see when you were reading off all the stats, I was kind of thinking to myself, I wonder how honest some of these teenagers have been. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. We absolutely take that point. And we have considered a, a number of different times of actually, you know, that well, I'm wearing a Fitbit, but you know, these kind of activity monitors that you can get and you can get all different types of actually recording as much as possible, um, you know, their sleep. And, and the study studies have, have done that, have taken that approach. One of the challenges in our field, of course, is actually how do we get data on social media use? Because Instagram, Snapchat, they are not giving up their data. And that's one of the big challenges that's been highlighted by government 
um, as well as a number of people in our field is like we won't really know what's happening but until these student, uh, students until these companies actually you know allow us access to the to the data on the other side of that is Yes, with a questionnaire, it is, we, we do find kind of correlations between subjective and objective. So we know that people will tend to, there's always, you know, a bit of variation in it. But I think the important thing that I always come back to is with the, the study that we did with the focus groups, that's what people were telling us about their experience. And we actually, with the development of the measure reviews, we've seen that consistent and that's been confirmed. So... Yeah, I always think that's part of doing surveys and that's being part of these measurements that it is, you will get variation on it. Um, you know, either being, oh yeah, you know, I never sleep them all whole night because I'm doing this and, you know, all the rest of it to go, I better not tell them how much I'm actually on it and I'll say I'm this way. But we get that with any measurement, uh, self-report measure that you're going to you're going to use. And I actually think, I mean, there'll be adults that would lie on surveys as well or or... Um, underestimate um, when, when they're answering it and, and it's, it might not be deliberate they just don't think they're maybe using it as much so I don't probably think that it's just a teenager thing because I mean I don't know about the people that have been listening to Heather tonight but certainly everything that you've been saying I can see it tying in with what my daughter does and like when you'd say like the seven and a half hours sleep at night that's probably about right like all yeah. that so Clearly, the information you are being given, I, I think, um, it, it is an accurate picture because I'm looking at my 14 year old and thinking, yeah, yeah, that kind of reflects. And it's interesting, yeah. And I think that's an interesting part of it is speaking to parents, speaking to teachers, and saying, okay, so what's your experience of this? As well <laughs> as speaking to the young people, and they're going, yeah, that's it. You know, so this is what the data is telling us. Does this match you? Yeah, that sounds that sound sounds about right. Yeah. So it's about using these different um these different approaches to try and understand. And you know, I, I think about you know it's it's not so much about well, of course you know you want an accurate picture, but also it's about that this you know, what self report actually allows you to do is you know with sleep that's a very good we we know that with the sleep measures that we use there is very very high correlations when we actually give an objective measure of numbers of hours of sleep. So we know that there are high correlations there. But what's also important of that is if somebody's telling you, I perceive that I only sleep X amount, that in itself is interesting. Because yeah. then if you're like, well, actually, so you, but you're not, you're sleeping nine hours. Why do you feel you're only sleeping five? That's interesting in itself. Yeah. Um, and Mary's asked another question. Um, I suppose it's, this is kind of connected to the sleep side of it. Um, what do you think about later school start times? Yeah, I think it's hugely challenging and I think it's hugely interesting. I know that it's very, very challenging to do. I know a number of projects have tried to look at this and look at the benefits. There's actually a recent study. I haven't read the paper, but it is reporting positive impact of that. It always brings me back to, um, it's so interesting. I was at a conference, lucky enough to go to Paris on a conference when that was one of the perks of academia is that you got to do that every now and again. And I remember speaking, a lot of the school start time research has actually been done in the States because um, you know in other countries around the world but in the states and some in the, in the US and some states they actually might start as early as half past seven in the morning mm -hmm. in the UK we actually start quite late already with sort of 10 to 9 9 o'clock being the the usual <clears throat> so um and I always remember um Judith Owens who's really kind of a big researcher in this area and one of the major obstacles to changing start times in the US was the school buses changing the timetable of that so I think one of the challenges of changing school start times is the ripple effect it has on so many other things yeah. you know and as parents we can all understand like oh what do you mean you're not starting school to 10 o'clock so what yeah. am I what am I supposed to do here so there are a lot of challenges with it I do come back to sort of saying we do start quite late compared to some of the, the the areas where they're looking at this and actually pushing it back you will see them pushing school start times back to nine o'clock um, I know with I don't know if you're a parent or a teacher Mary I, I don't know where you're coming but I know that um, a lot of teachers do come and ask me to come and speak to their kids about you know sleep and, and getting enough sleep because they see them especially in the return to school 
mm-hmm. last year in August, how tired they were and how much because their sleep pattern had just completely shifted. You know, you didn't necessarily have to be getting up for school. So you would go to sleep a bit later and sleep a bit later and that shift back. Now, that's a biological process. There's not much we can do about that. But I do think, um, I think there's still work to be done on it. But I think it's a hugely interesting question. My concern would just be that you started school later, then my daughter would just go to bed later. <laughs> and, like, it's just kind of shifting the problem forward. Like, and an hour, think, it's uh-huh. not really giving her any more sleep or anything. It's just kind of moving it forward a bit. And I think, I think that's one of the big challenges about this field in itself is that, you know, how, how do we actually manage adolescent sleep? How do you manage that as a family? How do you manage that as a school? If you're seeing kids that are coming in that are exhausted and are still asleep and should actually still be asleep, but that's not going to be the same for everyone. So it's this kind of, you know, understanding the diversity within this, within this population that some people are quite happy nine o'clock is absolutely the fine, you know, fine school start for them. But for other kids, they're really, you know, really struggling at that particular time. And I think that is a huge challenge. If you shift it for everybody, how does that, how does that suit everybody? Well, people just go, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not tired or actually, you know, if the motivating factor for delaying going to sleep is talking to your friends and all of you aren't starting school to 10 o'clock, does everybody just shift? Yeah, so that actually leads quite well onto Lynn's question. Um, Lynn is probably asking the question that a lot of us maybe want to know. What did the teens in the study suggest as top tips to improve their sleep? Oh, if right. I can remember. <laughs> if I can remember, I'm like, why did I put that? Did I not put that on home? I'm wondering actually if I've got a wee slide in that because sometimes what I do is uh, I keep wee bits uh, towards the end. No, do you know what I didn't? Um, so really kind of the top tips, the, the top tip that came out of it and I thought was hugely interesting um, was actually talking to each other and kind of just agreeing, setting those boundaries and saying, look, do you know what? What I tend to do is go to my bed at half past 10. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put my phone on do not disturb at 10. And that's what I'm going to do. And actually going, right, well, I'll do the same then. I'll do the same. And then it means that we're all kind of agreed. Understanding the importance of having that wind down time and that it's not necessarily me being rude. It's about me valuing my sleep and saying, look, lovely to see, you know, that kind of way of going, lovely to see you all, really enjoyed your company, but it's time I have to start just allowing myself to wind down and, and, and feeling sleepy and that's okay. I'm going to allow myself to go to sleep and talking about people's, you know, everybody's sleep patterns. Yeah. And I'm thinking just even as a parent, like maybe um, as parents, we, we should be kind of encouraging our, our teens and saying it's all right to say that like it's it's you're not being rude um and you're you're not um you're probably not going to miss much um and it, it's okay like try and kind of encourage them to be confident enough I suppose yeah. to maybe say that because I can imagine there'd be some young people being a wee bit like oh I don't really want to say that in, in case I get teased or, or in case people think I'm being rude or something so maybe um us as parents could try and encourage that um like encourage our teens to feel confident enough to just yeah. say no actually I'm I'm going to come off the now I'm, I'm yeah. going to my bed <laughs> yeah no I, absolutely and I think that's I think that's really um really important so what if you don't mind I'm just going to share my screen one I've just realized I've, I've missed one slide there but I think it, that was really the kind of value of the peer-led activities the pupil-led activities in school yeah was, it sounds it yeah, let's, so let's talk about this. So, all right, I never realised because the, the data that we were given applied to them, it really mm-hmm. enabled them to have a conversation and go, do you think that too? That's what I thought, but I didn't want to yeah. say anything. You know, yeah. all of a sudden it changes. Do you mind okay. if I just share my screen one more time? Just- yeah, that's okay. fine. Um, what I'll do is when you, I'll read out the questions that we've got. Um, question here from Alison um, and then Iqbal as well. Um, so Alison saying pupils at the moment in her classroom, so she must be a teacher, mm-hmm. um, seem to be very tired, but they seem to be more on their devices than pre-lockdown. Do you think this is a preconceived 
um, perception of teachers or has there actually been a change since lockdown? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, and Iqbal, I suppose, is just kind of adding on to that, saying uh-huh. that um, se- they're a secondary school teacher too, and it's worrying to see how little importance kids give to their sleep. Home learning definitely, in their opinion, has impacted um, it negatively. That's so interesting. That's so interesting. And it's one thing that I'm going to be looking at a study that I'm going to start next academic year um, with one of our one of our students because she reported <coughs> that it was actually, she felt that social interaction was smoother and calmer and, and, and nicer actually when it was done during the night and she found that all her friends were going online to talk during, you know, sort of later um, in the evening. Um, and I think that I think that's really interesting. I, I, I couldn't give you an evidence-based answer in terms of has device use increased, but I do wonder if there's something there about, you know, understanding that our young people have been, have not been able to see each other. So, more WhatsApp chats and groups and things will have been set up to facilitate that those conversations. So I wonder whether, and I think that's a really interesting research question to ask. So I've got a wee research idea in my head now. So who asked, asked yeah. that question? Um, so that was Alison initially, and then Iqbal added this as uh-huh. well. Um, well, I'm saying Iqbal, I, I don't know, sorry, if that's your surname or, or your first name, it's just the way your name was shown up. Um, what I would also kind of say is, I mean, definitely everybody use of devices, I think, increased during COVID. We were all <laughs> kind of relying on them. Um, but going back to what you'd said either, earlier, Heather, I think that's kind of the world that we're living in is we're all using multiple devices. Mm-hmm. And I don't necessarily think it's that like our screen time, if that's what you want to call it, has increased. It's, it's just the world that we live in. I mean, I'm sitting here just now. I'm on a PC to you guys. I've got a laptop beside me that I also use and then I have my smartphone. Uh-huh. Um, so it's we're just all on multiple devices, but I don't necessarily think that that definitely means that you're increasing your amount of screen time. But I think, but you know, I think it, it comes back to the question of like, well, what, what does that tell us about, yeah, mm-hmm. okay, has screen time increased or decreased? Well, you know, what does that tell us? Because I'm thinking about a, a, right here today so I've basically been on I'm on my PC here talking to you as you say I've got my phone there but this PC has been on since probably half past seven this morning and I've I've I had my lunch at it I took yep. a break for dinner and I've back on but what that doesn't tell you for all those hours that I've been on it but it doesn't tell you about what I'm doing yeah you know yep. and that's the important part of it and so I wonder um, and I think this would be really interesting to kind of pursue it and look at a little bit more, has rather than the amount of time we're on the device, has the number of people that we're speaking to through that device, has that increased the different platforms we're accessing? Have we got more social groups so- sorted and mm-hmm. that we couldn't necessarily see? For example, I've, the number of WhatsApp groups that I'm, uh, that I'm now part of, which is lovely, and connecting, I've actually met so many more different people over the last uh, last year because people have been creating these online groups rather than being on offline groups. So we can yeah. keep contact with people. So I think that's rather than thinking about time on device, but I think it's a very relevant question. Actually thinking about has the number of groups that they're connecting with or different activities that they're doing online, has that increased? Yeah. Well, we'll just had another question pop up there while we're waiting um so kareen's asking all homework for my two children or i think it's maybe just a comment all homework for my two children is all done uh, now on the ipad so they don't even have actual reading books so yeah that's just tying into what we are saying like i mean if they're just on that say for two hours doing homework then yep. that's not really relevant to the, the social side of it. Um, yep, and exactly. So uh-huh. that, that is, that's useful, and that's just the way the world has gone now, that, that yeah. we're using digital devices for homework kind of thing. And, and I think that's exactly it, and it's a way of, it, yeah, it's, it's for homework. Um, and I see it, you know, part of my job is research, and part a big part of my job is teaching, 
And so the way we've had to deliver our curriculum at the University of Glasgow School of Psychology has been online. So but we've also used the, the platforms that we have, like Microsoft Teams, like Zoom, to connect with each other, no matter where our students are. I've got students in South Africa, we've got students in China, we've got students, you know, all over the world in all different time zones. But having the ability to connect online has really supported all of us to get through the past year, which has been incredibly difficult. So again, it's just moving beyond not what how long you're on the screen, but what are you what are you doing? What are you up to? Are you doing homework? Are you chatting with your friends? You know, are you accessing information that will really enable you to critically evaluate the information that has been thrown at us every day? So yeah. I think it's about digging a little bit deeper around just screen time. Yeah.